everybody. Let us return to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Last Sunday morning, we, we looked at the issue of ambassadorship, okay? And um, I'm, I'll tell you what, let me go ahead and read uh, beginning at verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'll begin reading at verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then... We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness, righteousness of God in him. So we introduced last Sunday morning the issue of ambassadorship. The Apostle Paul, of course, is an ambassador. We, by extension, also function as ambassadors. And uh, as ambassadors, we recognize that there are some uh, key qualities and characteristics. And if you allow me to repeat uh, some of those characteristics, we went through it last Sunday morning, but just remind uh, yourself that an ambassador is appointed by the king. Uh, an ambassador is not, quote, voted into the position. The ambassador is uh, a representative of a kingdom or state. The ambassador is committed only to the state's interest. The ambassador embodies the nation state or kingdom. The ambassador is totally covered by the state. The ambassador is totally protected by his government. The ambassador never becomes a citizen of the state or kingdom to which he is assigned. As ambassadors, we never adopt the ways, the culture, the lifestyle, the sentiments, the values, the mentality of the uh, world that we find ourselves in. As ambassadors, our family, our rights, our property, our loyalty, our allegiance is to our heavenly kingdom, our heavenly citizenship. And of course, as ambassadors, we literally are the voice of heaven. Uh, we're not going to go back to Second Chronicles, but I thought there in Second Chronicles chapter 35, there is a very beautiful description of an ambassador. Remember the king of Egypt, Nico, and uh, Nico is uh, going to uh, engage in battle with Josiah. And what Nico, the king of Egypt, does is he sends his ambassadors. And if you read the verse carefully, the ambassadors did not say, well, King Nico is saying this, or King Nico has said that. The ambassadors did not say, thus saith King Nico. What did the ambassadors do? They used the personal pronoun I. In other words, the ambassadors said, I don't want to fight you. I am ready to fight you. I... It's as though Nico was there speaking personally with Josiah. But Nico could have been on the other side of the continent. That is uh, an example of the position that an ambassador has, the official voice, the official representative of the kingdom which they represent. Uh, and lastly, an ambassador never speaks his own personal position or opinion on any issue. Now, you can have your own personal views and opinions, but an ambassador is assigned to the task of repeating the claims of the king. Repeat the claims of the king accurately and precisely. The ambassador has no right to interject and add or diminish 
from the information the king has given. So being an ambassador is a critically, critically important office. And we are ambassadors. And we mentioned last Sunday morning that there are three components to being an ambassador. We are emissaries of heaven. Shorewood Bible Church is an embassy. Ambassadors are political creatures. Now, that doesn't mean we engage in the political machinery that we find ourselves in. When I say political, meaning We are members of Christ. We are translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Our conversation is where? In heaven. So we we want to recognize that we are political animals, in air quotes, okay? Meaning we represent our divine sovereign, our divine emperor. Being an ambassador is is obviously a critically important diplomatic role that we have, okay? We're diplomats. We're emissaries. We're uh, uh, on a mission, a mission from heaven itself, okay? And when I use the word diplomacy... Uh, we'll, we'll go back to Colossians here in just a second. But, but the three components that we want to be mindful of when it comes to functioning as an ambassador, there are three skills that an ambassador needs to hone. Number one, the ambassador must have an accurate knowledge and understanding of the, the will and the wishes of, of his sovereign emperor, okay? So the first component in being a, an ambassador, now this is our mission, this is our ministry, Paul calls it the ministry of reconciliation. We need to have an accurate message. Secondly, we want to have an artful method. Now let, let's go over to Colossians chapter four. We, we left off here, uh, if I recall, last Sunday morning, and uh, just notice When uh, Paul here writes at Colossians chapter 4, notice there, verse 5, Colossians 4, verse 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. So that verse really captures the essence of being a diplomat. To be a diplomat does not mean we soft shoe, we compromise, we schmooze, we soft pedal the information that our divine sovereign has given to us. That, you know, being a Uh, diplomat has negative connotation to it, right? But we're talking about being an ambassador for our Lord Jesus Christ. And we do engage in diplomacy. That does not mean we are compromising. See, uh, the the negative uh, uh, connotations associated with being diplomatic, it conjures And, you know, obviously governments, they enter into negotiation. The gospel, the gospel is unnegotiable. So remember, when we talk about being a diplomat, we're not doing whatever it takes to get the other, other party to sign the, the line, okay? Being a diplomat is not about compromising and hammering out some sort of a deal where everybody walks away happy. That's how the governments of of the world operate. We, being diplomatic, means exactly what we just read in Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. We develop the tact, we develop the skill in dealing with people. To be an emissary of heaven, to be diplomatic, that means we do the right thing, we say the right thing at the right time. 
without yielding our position when it comes to the truth. Now, one more thing before we move on. So secondly, not only we must have an accurate message uh, because we're speaking in the stead of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's an awesome responsibility. We, we should be repeating exactly what Jesus would communicate. If the Lord Jesus Christ were to walk into this room and say, Alexi, this is what I want to tell you. We are in his stead to repeat the claim. By the way, go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. This is kind of an interesting verse. If, if, if I say to Alexi, thus saith the Lord, it's no different than the Lord being literally present in front of Alexi. You understand what I'm saying? So, so it's a sobering, powerful, and humbling position. So remember, to be a diplomat means we want to be wise. We want to, we want to you know, season our speech. We want, to, we want to use grace. We want to be kind. We want to use tact. We want to be loving without ever compromising the message that has been entrusted to us. Notice what Paul, for example, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received uh, the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. You see that word sounded out? In the Greek, we get the word echo. So wait a minute. When Paul commends the Thessalonians for sounding out the word of the Lord. The idea behind it is we're repeating the claims of the Lord. We are, you know what an echo is, right? Uh, not that we have mountain, although, well, that was in Alaska. We were in, in a mountain range, but you know the idea behind an echo. The echo repeats the sound. It doesn't alter it. It doesn't diminish from it. It doesn't add to it. It's an accurate echo. It's an accurate uh, repetition of the very information that the Lord Jesus Christ is communicating. All right? So uh, we, we, we recognize <laughs> there is this diplomatic approach that we want to develop. Walk in wisdom. I love what the Lord, remember what the Lord said to the disciples? Um, he says, you guys, you know, you need to be, uh, you have to have the hearts of a, of a dove, but I want you to be wise as what? Serpent. Wisdom. Be wise in the way you conduct yourself. Be wise in the way you're, you're communicating in their case, the gospel of the kingdom. And then, of course, the third component that we want to be mindful of is the the manner in which we are communicating. So the idea here is, listen, we can have an accurate message. We can have all of the information. We can develop this wise approach, this diplomatic approach. But you know what? Our character might break our mission. In other words, the message and the method is packaged in our person, our manner. So the third component is also critically important. So we, if we can say, want an attractive manner. We don't want to be uh, unkind. We don't want to be unruly. We don't want to be ungracious. The, the ambassador will tactfully, accurately communicate the message knowing that behavior can make or break the mission that the ambassador has been entrusted with. Now, before we go on here, uh, maybe you don't know, June is Pride Month, all right? 
And uh, in fact, you'll notice, I did, you know, you'll notice the rainbow flags and so on and so forth. All right. So anyway, with that said, interestingly enough, this past week, I, I, in the morning as I get ready, I'll listen to some talk radio. And uh, they played a segment. There is a supposed uh, Christian woman out there. She's one of these influencers. Uh, they have, you know, they have these followings. I don't know what media, social media platform she's on. But she professes to be a Christian. And her challenge to the Christian community is, well, during Pride Month, Christians need to be more tolerant. They need to be more affirming. They need to be more accommodating. They need to be more supportive. They need to be more accepting of the LGBTQT plus 100 pluses community, right? And, um, but if you listen to her language, uh, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. She was, as I'm listening to her, surrendering and sacrificing the truth in the name of affirmation and acceptance and, and support. Now you think about, let me, let's use the uh, uh, rough, a doctor. Uh, a doctor who's treating a patient. Can you imagine if, if you have a physician who doesn't want to offend his patient, doesn't want to scare his patient, doesn't want to anger his patient, a doctor who is willing to tolerate self-destructive behavior in the name of affirmation and, and acceptance and tolerance, is that love? Is, is that a good physician or a bad physician? You, you, you understand, that's a, that's a pretty obvious, rough illustration. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, notice there at verse 6, uh, by the way, in the context, it's charity. We understand that. Verse 4, right? Charity suffereth long. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not. Uh, verse 6, 1 Corinthians 13. What, about, what, what, what do we know about charity? Charity rejoiceth not in what? Iniquity. But rejoiceth in the what? Truth. Love has been sacrificed. Love has been carnalized. Love has been demeaned by the, the world, this, the culture. But unfortunately, love has been carnalized by even some within the, quote, Christian community, where, wow, we need to affirm, we need to support we need to love members of the transgender community, so on and so on and so forth, right? And what begins to happen is you, you begin to conflate. and You begin to cross-pollinate. You begin to confuse. You, you begin to cloud up. Wait a minute. You mean love is merely embracing the lifestyle that an individual chooses to engage in? Is that love? What does verse 6 say? Charity rejoiceth in the what? The truth. The most unloving thing that a Christian can ever do is sacrifice the truth to get along with any community. Remember, an ambassador is a representative of the sovereign, of the king, of the emperor. And an ambassador will never uh, 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 diminish from the accuracy of the message and information being communicated. I, I want to go just very, very quickly. Go over to 1 John, 1 John chapter uh, 4. 1 John chapter 4. And here's the verse that will be thrown out. Here's the verse that, that might be thrown into your face. Uh, if we speak out, for example, 
We, listen, I, I speak out against same-sex marriage. I speak out against killing unborn babies. I speak out against, uh, but by the way, and, and you know, it's easy to pick on those groups, right? Listen, I speak out against adultery. I speak out against lying. I speak out against thievery. I, you know, what, 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 are you going to go through this whole list now? But, of course, this is a month where everybody is demanding and insisting we have to be loving. So here's the verse that might be thrown out. First John chapter 4, look there at verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is what? Love. But don't let the world hijack and redefine true love. Godly love, divine love. By the way, we're not studying 1 John, but in the context, love has everything to do with God's justice being satisfied. It has nothing to do with warm fuzzies and waving a flag and embracing and tolerating and affirming and supporting in the context, drop down quickly to verse 10. Herein is what? You want to know how much God, God is love, right? So does God say, I love you so much that I'm going to tolerate your sin? I'm going to tolerate your, your self-destructive behavior because, just so that I don't hurt your feelings? Herein is love. So obviously there's a context, right? God is love. No question, verse 8. Well, then let's define it, verse 10. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for what? That's love. Not to ignore sin, not to uh, diminish sin, not to sweep sin under the, the, the rug, not to tolerate sin, never to accept sin. But you know what love is? God choose, chose to deal with sin. That's love. It's a lie. Uh, well, tell you what, go to chapter 1. All right, I, I really didn't mean to. I, I just, you know, maybe I, that's why i got to stop listening to talk radio. I get all. <laughs> but, but, but you know what? Well, let's bring a little clarity here because the Christian community, not, not, you know, there are elements within the Christian community that they're, they're falling victim to some of this language and thinking where we got to hold these people by the hand. And by the way, we're going to talk about our methodology here, right? We, we want to be loving, but not, let's not carnalize the idea. Notice in chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, and we read there at verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him, <laughs> by the way, and what? Declare unto you. It sounds like an ambassador to me, right? This is what I heard from my king, and this is what I'm going to declare. Anyway, this is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now, notice verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not what? The truth. God is love, but God is light. Did you catch verse 5 there? God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Well, what does it mean for God to be light? Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in what? Darkness, we're lying and do not the truth. Light, God is light. It's truth. Remember what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Charity, it doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in what? Truth. True love is maintaining the truth. The truth is God only created two genders. The truth is God's design is for man and women to be married. The truth is, I mean, we can go through the whole list, correct? But truth, yes, we love. One more verse in, 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 in relation to some of this. Go to Philippians chapter uh, 2. Philippians chapter 2. And I, we'll probably go back to this verse a little bit later on. But, but just notice, for example, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. Philippians 2 verse 14. 
do all things without murmurings and disputings. Ouch. At least me. Ouch. You know, I'm grumbling, belly aching. You know, I'm saying, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Verse 15, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Is there any nation that isn't crooked and perverse? Well, and there's obviously there's a, a relationship to the nation of Israel, but quite frankly, a, a Gentile governments can accurately be described as being crooked and perverse, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, truth. So always remember, yeah, God is love, but God's love is is manifested in a very specific context. He's dealing with sin, not excusing sin. But God is light. Truth. Darkness is the lie program. Light is the truth. Hence, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, the exhortation is shine. What does it mean to shine? Truth, truth, truth. Verse 16, holding forth the word of of life. Now, when we do that, our culture may react negatively. When we do that, the culture might be enraged. The culture might might rise up and fight back. And that could very well happen. And if we have time, we'll see that that's what happened to the Thessalonians. And what the culture did at Thessalonica, they used the arm of human government to stop the Christian from fulfilling their mission and their responsibility in accurately conveying a message. Hopefully we're using the proper methodology and we're going to back it up by our character and behavior, the manner in which we do that, okay? I guess what I'm getting at is don't be shocked when we're seeing what's happening today in our current culture. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, one more thing I want to add. Did you know what Evanston is going The Evanston Public Library, you know what they're going to do for this month? Um, they're, they're bringing in drag queens to read during story hour, uh, to read to th three- and four-year-olds. Three- and four-year-olds. I mean, so uh, there's tension, right? Do you get angry at that? I mean, I got three old. I got a, I've got a one-year-old grandkid. I've got a two-year-old grandkid. Uh, you know, I mean, having a drag queen reading to a three-year-old, and, and, you know, my, my stomach, you know, there's this tension, and there's like, what? well, what do we do? as ambassadors. One more time. Uh, oh, thank you, Charlotte. One word. T-R-U-T-A. Truth. Truth. That's the most loving thing we can do. Uh, one more time. Go to Colossians chapter 4, and then let's go over to 1 Peter chapter 3, okay? Uh, uh, Colossians chapter 4, because there's real similarity or parallel between Colossians and what Peter is going to write. Uh, and obviously, we know the context. Peter's writing specifically to the, the believing remnant, so on and so forth. But uh, we're, we're not concerned with that. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, again, let's read verse 5. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without. So my flesh reacts to some potential pedophile who gets sexual satisfaction dressing as a woman and pretending to be one. By the way, isn't that an insult to women, women, women? I mean, real, to be a real woman, do you want some guy representing what he thinks a woman is? I mean, I almost wonder, do you, got, do you women talk like some of these drag queens? Do you guys gyrate in front of three-year-olds? I mean, I'm not trying to gross anybody out, but is that kind of behavior taking place? Uh, as a woman, I would be outraged. You don't represent a woman just because you wear a dress, just because you put on makeup and high heels. 
and you talk weird. And it, it, I mean, it's like weird stuff. I've not, I'm not, I, I don't know women that do that. Women don't tolerate that. They're saying that's what a real woman is. That's not what a real woman is. So, so okay, uh, again, uh, in the flesh, my blood begins to boil, my blood pressure, you know, and it's a, and, and you know, uh, what did we just read in verse 5? Walk in what? Wisdom, diplomacy, tact, skill. I don't think we're going to deal with some of that today, but, but wait a minute. What kind of, how do we develop skill in a dress? See, we can go up to him, point our fingers, say, you're a blank. You're a this. But is there a better way? Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Verse 6, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. You see the, the diplomatic approach that we can choose to take. Don't let the emotion get the best of us, okay? And yeah, and, and by the way, it's easy to single out certain sinful behavior that can enrage us. But sometimes we overlook other sinful behaviors that maybe don't enrage us as much. Who are we to pick and choose which sin is going to enrage me? Listen, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, the top eight Proverbs, you know, pride, a proud look, and, and you go on and you go through that list, right? But uh, now go to First Peter chapter 3, all right? So... Uh, let's let's remember we're emissaries okay we're emissaries we represent the embassy of heaven we stand in christ's stead and and you know what instead of reacting emotionally getting all stirred up and doing what the world does you know the mob the reaction the rage the toxic caustic uh, uh vile you know nastiness no grace seasoned with salt isn't that beautiful seasoned with salt we got to develop that skill. I mean, it, it doesn't come naturally. We have to develop that skill. First Peter chapter 3. This is a, a verse that is worth considering in relationship to what we're talking about. First Peter chapter 3, notice there at verse uh, 15. Uh, verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Now, by the way, is God sanctified? <laughs> You better believe. You know what it means to be sanctified, to be set apart. Listen, God is above everything. So, In other words, let God have that special, unique, set-apart place in the realm of your thinking. But sanctify the Lord God. He is holy, right? Does he have a holy place in your heart? Yeah, that's what Peter's saying. But, but, but let the Lord God have a holy place in your heart. Now notice, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason. Now, you know, an ambassador has to be reasonable. Now, I, mean, I don't mean reasonable again being compromising. Reasonable as in, I'll give you reasons, okay? I'll give you reason why you need a savior. You see what I'm saying? We, we give, uh, give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. Check it out. With what? Meekness and fear. But wait a minute. Look back at verse 14. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror. Wait a minute. Peter says in verse 14, should you, the immediate audience, and, and, and should believers be afraid of the world? Should we be afraid of men? Verse 14, be not afraid of their what? Terror, and believe you me, the world is going to launch a terror campaign against the believer. We're fortunate. 2,000 years ago, you wouldn't want to be part of Nero's terror campaign against the Christian. But the point there is, that's the Roman government. The day will come 
where perhaps our government is going to launch a terror campaign against Christians. We see little things happening now. But, but verse 14, don't be afraid of their terror. By the way, that means there is a terror campaign. Uh, uh, the end of the verse, neither be what? Trouble. Okay, so Peter says, I don't want you to be afraid of these people. Don't be intimidated by their tactics, their scare tactics, by their threats, you know, by, uh, by the, their, langu- their demeaning language. And, and so he says, don't be afraid of that. But he says there at verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Let God have that place of rule in the way you think. And be ready. See, that's what a diplomat does. Don't be caught off guard. You know, I'm tempted to spend some weeks looking at evangelism training clinic. You know, in the ETC program, you know, we've done it in, in years past. And, you know, one of the keys in effective evangelism is, 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 is being prepared, being ready. Paul says, I'm a debtor, uh, and I'm not ashamed, but I am ready to preach the gospel to you also that are at Rome. Are we ready? Or are we caught off guard because somebody says something bad about us and demeans and, and you know, offends us? Uh, wait a minute. We always want to be ready. Be prepared. Develop the skills. Develop the tools in, in our heart. Anyway, verse 15, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with, here we go, with meekness and fear. Is Peter contradicting himself? He says at the end of verse 15, do it with fear. But then in verse 14, what does he say? He says, don't be afraid of the terror. Well, which is it? Both. What Peter's saying is, when it comes to humanity, when it comes to the, uh, the gears of government, when it comes to the culture, and they launch that terror campaign to shut us down or to shut us in prison, perhaps, Peter says, don't be afraid of that. But we're ready to give an answer in fear. It's not a contradiction. It's understanding who, what is the, where, what is the source or cause of fear? In other words, don't be afraid of the outward. Don't be afraid of the, the terror. But the fear that Peter's talking about is verse 16. Having a good conscience that whereas, whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers. Wow, that's part of the terror campaign. And by the way, wasn't Paul accused of being an evildoer? He had to appear before court. He had, he, had, he had trial dates, you know. And what a sad testimony at, towards the end of his ministry. Paul shows up for court, and Paul says, no man stood with me. No one was there to, to be a character witness. Nobody was there to defend. Uh, no man stood with me. But then what does he say? But the Lord. See, the Lord is the issue. Anyway, they, verse 16, they may, that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. In other words, don't be afraid of the outward terror campaign, but do what you're supposed to be doing in meekness and in fear. That is, listen, be afraid of not having, verse 16, a good conscience. Be afraid, verse 16, of not having a good conversation. Be afraid of not accurately representing the Lord Jesus Christ in word and in attitude and in deed. By the way, Paul, and let me, before we go over, he also says the end of verse 15, meekness. Okay, what does that mean, meekness? Does that mean we roll over and play dead? That is not what meekness is. Meekness has every, there's, there's two things to keep in mind when, when we look at the Bible word meekness. Now, number one, 
to be meat means we never draw or acquire our strength from our own personal abilities and resources. In other words, to be meat means I'm going to rely on another power. I am going to draw and, and uh, acquire power and strength from an outside source, and that's going to be the word of God, okay? So to be meek means I, I, I'm not going to be the one mustering up the skill and the talent and the, uh, the methodology to deal with the unsafe people. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be meek and allow God's word to tell me how to do that. But meek also means we are never the cause of offense, that's, that's what, you know, Moses was the meekest man on earth. The Lord Jesus Christ, remember what he said? He said, I am meek and lowly. Jesus didn't go around hitting people's hats off and tripping them and causing them to fall. Jesus was meek in the sense he was never the cause or source of provocation. He didn't go around picking a fight. He preached the truth. And the truth can be fighting words in the world that is blinded by the lie program, okay? But Jesus didn't deliberately, you know, stick his finger in people's throats and, come on, come on, I dare you, I dare you. That isn't how Jesus conducted himself. So to be meek means you'd never be the source of harm. Don't be an agitator. Don't be a provocateur. I mean, don't, don't provoke people. Don't be the cause of offense. That's what it means to be meek. By the way, we also use the word humble, right, or humility. What's the difference between being meek and being humble? Being meek says, I'm not going to stick my finger in your eye and pick a, pick a fight with you. I'm not, I'm not here to provoke you. I'm not here to, by the way, when you have little kids, they're notorious, right? I mean, it's almost comical. You know, they, they just keep picking and picking and picking until they finally, the, you know, the little brother reacts, you know, stop it. And uh, to be meek means don't do that. To be humble means I'm going to endure the offense and the attack and the provocation and the harm that's coming my way. So look at meekness and humility as uh, uh, kind of like a, a highway. You got two directions. One direction says, I'm not going to provoke you to anger. I'm not going to offend you. That's meekness. Humility says, when you do it to me, I'm going to endure. I'm not going to fall apart in a million pieces. I'm not going to freak out. I'm not going to explode. Humility says, I'll, 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 I'll take it. I'll endure it. Two beautiful uh, uh, ways of understanding meekness. But, but Peter says, and fear. Again, the fear has everything to do with verse 16. Fear, listen, you make, you believers, make sure you have a good conscience and a good conversation, okay? That's the better fear. Now go over to first, uh, Second Timothy chapter 1. Paul, uh, he, he also, in challenging Timothy, is going to use language. And you know what we're getting at is, listen, we're going to talk about what our mission really is. Yes, we'll look at particulars, the method, and all that kind of stuff. But, but notice 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Remember, context, right? When Paul says, uh, to, writes to Timothy, listen, we're not, God is not the one who instills or gives this spirit of fear. Fear. In the context, fear of what? You look there at verse 8, obviously. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. That's meekness, by the way. The power of God. If we do it in our own uh, efforts and, and, and resources, uh, we're, 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 we're going to have a tough time. But anyway, the, the context, listen, don't be afraid. There will be afflictions that are part and parcel of this mission and mystery. Drop down to verse 12. For 
the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Drop down chapter 2 and look there at verse 9. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evil doer. Verse 12. If we suffer, chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Verse uh, 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. God has not given us the spirit of fear. In the immediate context, it has everything to do with this campaign of terror that is being, that is being launched, and it will entail, perhaps, the persecutions and the sufferings and the afflictions. Don't be terrified by that, Timothy. Okay? Don't be terrified by that. But what is it that God has provided Go back to chapter 1, verse 7. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's how we overcome the fear. We overcome with, number one, the the, the power that Paul's talking about. Keep your finger here. Go over to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 11. Colossians 1, verse 11. Strengthened with all might according to his, what? Glorious power unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness, giving thanks. That's power. That's power. Remember that one image years ago? That was actually during the Vietnam War. Uh, Back in the day, you know, they actually sent National Guard troops on some of the college campuses, which, you know, thank goodness they're not doing that anymore. But, I mean, so anyway, you have these, you know, uh, members of the reserve unit. They've got the, uh, their M16s. And, and you know, it's, it's really disturbing pictures to see reservists with M16, and they're pointing their rifles at college students. You know, not a good image. I don't care who's the president, right? And, and there's this one iconic picture of one of the protesters, maybe some of you old timers remember, and she took a flower and, and she stuck that flower in the barrel of the M16. What an iconic picture. You know, now of course it was used for propaganda. Now here's the power, here's the man, and they're ready to open fire and kill all of these peaceful demonstrators okay anyway but but the point is this so you have this one image of of the the terror the threat of force the intimidation i'll shoot you and this woman she she takes a flower and she puts it in the barrel i thought that wow what an iconic image what did that communicate listen under threat power god's given us the the a spirit of power that is the ability not to capitulate not to crumble not to give up ground instead we're strengthened with all might according to his glorious power and you know what we can be patient we can be long-suffering with joyfulness stick the flower of truth in the barrel of the terrorist I mean, that's kind of a weird picture. And and, and look at verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father. What a privilege to be an emissary. What a privilege. Uh, And then Paul, of course, go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, Not only God hasn't given us the spirit of fear where we are gripped by terror because of the the, the campaign uh, that is launched, but of power and of what? Love. That, by the way, doesn't mean you got to love so much as, you know, we are, we are driven by his love. This is something, our ambassadorship is love-driven. It's not fear-driven. And love can go two ways, right? We, we studied 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. The love of Christ, what? Constraineth us. His deep love and adoration were beloved much more. God who is rich 
His great love. Listen, when, when we understand that our mission is motivated by, it's, it's energized by, it is driven by this love that our Heavenly Father has for His emissaries, His ambassadors. That, that's the spirit, that's the type of love that Paul here is referring to. Go over to Romans chapter 5. Here's the, the, the love that drove Paul. Now, Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says, listen, Timothy, I'm not ashamed. And Timothy, you know what? You can and should be a partaker. Notice how Paul, when writing to the, Clint, uh, writing to the Romans in Romans chapter 5, um, obviously we, we really do have to read uh, verse, okay, we're going to read verse 3 because not only do we not have the, the spirit of fear, we have the uh, we have the spirit of power and of love and and of what a what sound mind. What does Paul mean? A sound mind. He's talking about verse three. Look at Romans five verse three. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. What's that next word? Knowing, Timothy, we 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 have a right way of thinking. When it comes to the afflictions, the persecutions, the sufferings, and so forth, right? We know something about the terror campaign. What do we know, verse 3? Knowing that tribulation, what? Works. That's what it means to have a sound mind. By the way, keep your finger here. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1. You know, Paul, he, he describes the sound mind that sustains him. In the terror campaign, he says, notice at chapter 1, verse 12, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Why? For I what? No. You see, here's the sound mind that Paul is talking about. The right perspective, the right way not only to evaluate what's taking place in culture, but the right way in which to think about it. Yes, we know there's a terror campaign. But verse 12, I know whom I have what? You know what? You're never going to be in your right mind until we know whom we have believed. See, uh, now go back to Romans chapter 5. We're, we're, we're going to stop here. But chapter 5, verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also knowing. Isn't it good to know when bad things happen, who shall separate us from the love of God? Isn't that beautiful? Now, the world thinks, you guys are weird. I, yeah, I'm weird for the Lord. I hope I am weird for the Lord. You know, I, like Paul says, beside myself. You know, you guys think I'm beside myself. You know, but but boy, we know some things anyway. Verse four and pa this is what we know: tribulation with patience. Verse four: patience, experience, experience, hope. Verse five: and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. We don't have to be gripped by fear. We don't have to be paralyzed by fear. Power. This enduring ability to, 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 to just uh, hold your ground. And, and we can do it with patience, with long-suffering, with joyfulness, giving God thanks. Because we know something about adversity. What do we know about adversity? It is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but to what? Also suffer for his sake. Isn't it good to know that? Isn't it good when Paul writes there in Acts, uh, he doesn't write Acts, but there, recorded there in the book of Acts, he, he tells the Ephesian elders, he said that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Isn't it good to know that? If we don't know that, our Christian lives would disintegrate. God's angry. God's punishing me. God's teaching me. No, we, we have a, quote, sound mind. But love, we're going to, we, our ambassadorship can only succeed if it is driven and energized by love, okay? 
Uh, I really would like to pick up on this. Verse 5, but hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. In the realm of my understanding, the Apostle Paul says that uh, I know some things about his love for me. And I know how much he loves me. I know how much he loves humanity. Christ came into the world to save sinners, whom I am chief. By the way, Paul says, in love and faith, right? So uh, Paul chose to let the same attitude that God has about him to occupy that special place in his heart. He enjoyed knowing how much God loved him. So we're, we're, I, I kind of deviated a little bit, but certainly uh, it's okay. You know what? Our mission is a love-driven mission. So we'll talk a little bit more since we're still in Pride Month. And, um, you know, we can, we can control and uh, we can, you know, uh, there's the old saying, you know, emotions are powerful, right? But emotions don't have to be authoritative. That's what a wise diplomat does, keeps the emotions in check. So we don't have to react emotionally when we see some of the debauchery that takes place. Let's walk wisely and uh, uh, let's, let's uh, have reason to answer every man who says, what is wrong with you people? So we'll talk more about it. Father, again, we do thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the privilege of being here as your divine representatives. May we always be mindful that uh, what we say, what we do, the way we think uh, is to be an accurate reflection of what you would say, what you would think, and what it is you would do. Uh, again, may our time together in recognizing what our role is as the emissaries of heaven, uh, may we be equipped to, to better handle uh, those that are without, walking wisely, and always bathing our response in grace, kindness, and, and certainly patience. And uh, we do ask in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.